What we're finding what is we're that finding people, people could mute their, their headphones, which is the top green icon, icon. there won't be all the background noise that people are hearing, and you'll be able to chat. So I can see that a few of you have muted it, but I think that, uh, if I could be helped thank Alex and very much Alex, I can see that. Alex, I can see that. <laughs> the other question had for people to take, take their own. Yep. And I'll, I'll just get to, uh, there you go. So we're, we're working our way here, folks, to a beginning, and we're, we're sure we're going to get there. And thanks for your patience, because we are, we are struggling at the moment. It looks like that uh, we, we are going to begin this webinar without a, a visual from, from me, which could be a, a blessing for all of you. But uh, I, I want to welcome you to our first webinar. And for all the teething problems we might have on this one, I'm sure we're still going to get the message of recovery across. So thank you for tuning in. And when we decided to, to look at what would we start with, what could, what could I get on here and talk to you about tonight for people that hopefully are going to get the message of the SVP message without being able to be here. So we thought, let's start with reinforcing your recovery. And so that's what we've decided to call the first webinar. If you need to, by all means, please, uh, if you're having any difficulties, text, mess, text us on the chat box. I've got our uh, public relations manager, Jackie, here beside me, and she'll be able to help us, uh, hopefully help you get online and hear what we've got to say. So the first, when I was thinking about reinforcing our recovery, I'm, I'm, I'm as a lot of folks that have heard me lecture here know, I'm a big fan of Pia Melody, and, and Pia's, what I liked about Pia's work is, is this model that we'll just briefly go over again at the beginning of this webinar is, is something that she says two things are really important, that we have to have two recoveries. The first is the recovery from our secondary symptoms, that, that we uh, come to SPP in a current crisis, that there's something that is really leading to lots of evidence of unmanageability, and we, we have to do something to interrupt that. And that's how most folks arrive. And, and when Pia talks about dealing with that secondary symptom, we, that's our first recovery, that we need to recover from those symptoms. And, and what we've got up there is that it, part of that priority one is there could be, a, as people come to SPP, you walk in here with one current crisis, and all of a sudden, with our model, you look through the lens, and we've got two or three current crises and before you know it there's a couple of other addictions or you might find some comorbidity with depression or anxiety that's that's all there for you to deal with and and I know that sometimes that can even get joked about at uh, SPP where you come in with one addiction and walk out with two or three but I'm always confident that if you walked in with them they that, that they've been causing you distress and we can actually help you deal with a series of addictions here which will lead to real change I think one of the points of difference that SPP has from a lot of other places is that we don't stop there. That's the, the, we, we, we go. And what I like about I like his work, work is the model, the model mm -hmm. that, that after the she the, 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 I'm actually hearing I'm actually the model, so I'm going to back at me now, guys. Bear with me. And that's the part of the model that I think it probably gives people the most freedom. When Pia talks about we get well from our secondary symptoms but our secondary symptoms are the history. When I was together, we can deal with the other with the other come in and out regularly. Regularly. What do I start? What do I start? I've got to do I think always
know, there you go. There John, you go. John, 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 and that we're perfectly imperfect. 
and, and, I, and I, I know that the best way for someone to achieve uh, that experience is to watch the adults in their life make their own imperfect mistakes and own them. I, I've uh, mentioned it in lectures here before. I heard uh, Scott Peck talk about uh, the fellow that wrote Road Less Travelled and many other books after that. That he, he was in an interview once and he said, I'm getting to the age where I'm expecting my son to return to me and tell me all the things I did wrong as a father and I'm ready for that conversation. And it always struck me that it wasn't that that uh, you know, I, I thought if anyone was going to get it right, it'd be fellows like them that wrote such profound literature. But even he was saying, "Look, in my perfect imperfection, I know I impacted the development of my child, and and I'm available for that conversation when they need to check things out with me." And and that's what I missed. I know in my family system, and I know in the families that I I work with, at times there was no capability, no maturity to own that imperfection, and that damages a child because they're never going to learn to be imperfectly imperfect if they're not witnessing, experiencing it in the adults around them and those adults if they're not able to do it will simply not be able to do it for the kids. Our dependency needs, that, that children's needs and wants and, and uh, when Pia talks about those basic needs she says something very profound in, in the, her series of mapping your, your recovery. Uh, she states that, that just getting your needs met age appropriately you only break even. You only break even in your development, and that, that we we are needing to also in that those dependency uh, issues be able to foster curiosity about the child's wants. What are their particular preferences, and how do you meet those? And I've certainly, when lecturing on this, said that not everyone gets a pony. You might want something, and you don't get that particular need met. But generally, in a family, we're able to hold the desire, and I think that's what. The, the, the dependency part of this developmental model is talking about is that we have certain needs, they need to get met, but it's, it's that curiosity and compassion towards the wants that, that allows that last moderation aspect to happen. If, if a child's being valued, they're very safe internally and externally, that they're allowed to be perfectly imperfect, that they're allowed to express their needs age appropriately, you're going to see wonderful spontaneity. And when uh, Bradshaw talks about uh, in healing the shame that binds you, he mentions a wonderful poem, and I can I, I wouldn't be able to recite it for you, but the bit I love is he talks about when a child is in that level of safety in their development, that they're just able to to simply be in the moment, and it's that being in the moment he says that you might grow up as an adult to be a poet, but there was a time once when you were poetry itself. And that spontaneity can only exist if those other four areas of development age appropriately are, are held. If we, if we could get if we can get a child to have that experience, of course, then they get all the gifts that come with that: the self-esteem, the ability as a mature adult to function with an inherent sense of worth, that that you're able to then age appropriately utilise your own boundaries, external boundaries, internal boundaries, and sexual boundaries that are incorporate both that you're really astute at your own reality. You can self-identify and, and uh, I've been working this, with, this week with folks that were highly traumatised and I can just see how disorganised their reality is and how so often they go to confusion because they have not got that internal compass uh, set to a true north, their true north. It's been disorganised and rearranged by the trauma and abuse they experienced. So, having that ability to know your reality and, it, and the only way you can know your reality um, the only way you can meet your needs and wants, sorry, is to know your reality, to know what you're thinking, what you're feeling, uh, what's your physical needs, and then have that ability to move to get them met. Age appropriately, and that's where moderation comes in. You can be spontaneous in the moment and respond. Now, the hypothesis of this model uh, it really rests on that, that bottom pane there. It says childhood lack of nurturing, trauma, and abuse, and neglect cause. Cause. A very powerful a hypothesis that they actually cause a developmental immaturity, that, that a child's resources then go into coping, they go into surviving the family system in whatever form that is. And I know that uh, at uh, South Pacific the questions often are, especially when you sit in group and you hear people have a variety of different traumas at a variety of different levels. And then the question can get asked by someone that might have accounted for their own trauma as less than dangerous than someone that had an acute physical or sexual trauma. And I think mostly after people experience this model, they realise that pain is simply pain, and that the developmental interruption for you is simply 
it is what it is, that it doesn't have to be measured against anyone else's. If that developmental immaturity has been has occurred due to less than nurturing behaviour, that's what we work with here. And that hopefully the empathy that you'll get with others is not around a specific form of trauma, but the simple fact that you've also been developmentally uh, impacted and that you uh, therefore need to grow certain skills in recovery to get well. The the primary symptoms that develop from this are usually where we, we, we lose a few people in early recovery and we gain a lot because it, I think our model is one of those few places once people come in, especially if they haven't met it, it looks pretty overwhelming all these boxes but, but when you start to put these pieces together regularly we're going to get folks that, and you might be able to, some of you might relate to this and some it might have took a while but that you see the impact of that developmental trauma and you see it around the value that you'll experience yourself as less than, that, 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 that's, that there's no inherent worth, there's a worthlessness and that can get triggered under stress. But generally in that wound, that, that wounded state is not a state that we stay in. In this very same family system that creates the wound, you'll see the defence mechanisms that create the way out, the survival skill. And, and they're very effective depending on depending on that family system, that better than can look really dramatically different. It, it, you could be a sheep shearer out at Cobar and that better than invulnerable, good, perfect, anti-dependent, controlling person could be a, a, a tanned, uh, beer drinking, muscular fellow that might take care of business with his fists and his defence mechanisms can very, be very abrupt and you can have exactly the same mechanisms in somebody that's very polite, good and perfect, well spoken, very articulate and, 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 and wouldn't hurt a fly. What, what I do know about these primary symptoms is that we're, we're looking again for themes, not a particular, a very particular image. And, and so with that, with that wound, what I know when people come into treatment is we, we, we look at, at around my esteem we, we, we look at an inappropriate level of esteem and then that, that less than the worthlessness that occurs in regards to boundaries and vulnerability if we didn't get that, that vulnerability protected that we grow up feeling too vulnerable and I see lots of uh, you know, clients coming to SBP too vulnerable but then at the flick of a switch they can go to invulnerable that they learn the ways in the family system to shut down and in, and in some occurrences we, we had to shut down, we had to, it was in our interest to turn off. In regards to our reality, that perfect imperfection, if you get shamed about your imperfection in whatever way, shape or form that is, then we will try to be good and perfect. And I always thought if I could bend P. Melody's ear, I'd have that rebellion on a sliding scale because in that wounded child, the rebellion is acting out from the wound and it's messy and it's on the floor and it's controlling through, through, uh, the, through the victim. Uh, the, through being a victim, but the, but there's a rebel that I think does exist in our in our adult adapted child, and that fits for any folks that found that subculture, that found that family system where they could just switch off, act like it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I sometimes call it the Fonzie disease. You, you really know it's not authentic. I, I think most people that watched Happy Days, and sorry for the age uh, the ageist reference, folks, but anyone that watched Happy Days worked out that Fonzie wasn't really that tough. Um, he was the pretty, probably the biggest untough rebel there ever was, but but the rebellion meant in, in Fonzie's case he just pushed his vulnerability down. And I think that if you can't be good and perfect, then you can't fail if you don't try. And that's what the rebel looks like on the on that reality side of the adult adapted child. Around dependency needs, and I see this all the time, and it certainly starts to get replayed out in our relationship issues. Is is if those needs don't get met, they remain unmet. And we will learn ways to be anti-dependent from our family systems, but we will always carry the wound of needs unmet. And, and if that then spills over into wants too, then people can leave very disorientated and that really does lead to moderation issues in the long run, that we will have trouble judging uh, meeting our needs, that there'll be an overindulgence at time, or uh, people will get some, some sense of control out of restriction, so we'll either do too much or too little. And I always like that the opposite of that, that spontaneity, spontaneity and openness that can happen when we get that, that wonderful opportunity to grow and develop in a healthy family system, in a family system that's functioning in pain, then the accumulation of feeling less than too vulnerable, bad, flawed and too dependent and out of control is that we, we just, we're just not functioning. And it's, it's, it's like a, a turtle without a shell, we're literally too vulnerable. 
and and it, it, those moments when we drop into that space is is the regressions we can have in our recovery. And I think why I talk about this tonight and reinforcing your recovery, these ego states are what we go into in early treatment. And they, and when we leave treatment, go into our recovery. This is where we under stress go back to. Because as we get on to looking, and I'll, I'll click onto the slide now, when we when we go on to looking at the secondary symptoms that are resulted uh, by, by uh, that result from untreated primary symptoms, when you get into treatment and then you get into recovery from those secondary symptoms, you've given up the one thing that actually helped you uh, stop feeling. It, it assisted your adult that adapted child to push things down. So when we come into treatment, give up alcohol or sex or drugs or food or work or exercise all of a sudden the stress rises and we are left to really deal with these primary symptoms. So if you find yourself down the track in recovery, really being more aware than less aware of your primary symptoms, that's normal. I, I, I can never reiterate that enough to people in early recovery that please don't think that your recovery is not working. Uh, Pia Melody actually uh, coined the phrase, or she used the phrase, trudging the road to your happy destiny as a way of talking about recovery meaning it's an oxymoron, of course, happy destiny, but we've got to trudge towards it. And she makes no secret that in the beginning of, of recovery, it's going to feel worse at times than it did even at the end of your using, because you're raw and you're confronted with these untreated primary symptoms, these underlying issues. And, and that can only happen if you get into recovery from that secondary symptom. Now, I'm going to share a per personal preference with you, so don't tell the rain. But I've always liked when we had the model previous to this where that line between secondary symptoms and relational problems went down the middle. And because I liked how our untreated primary symptoms will lead to secondary symptoms and they will result in current crises and unmanageability as a result of those secondary symptoms and the untreated primary symptoms and they lead to intimacy issues. You simply cannot have any of those secondary symptoms and underlying untreated primary symptoms and have a good relationship. It's impossible. You might have the guise of a good relationship. It might look good from the surface, at uh, the surface, uh, but, but underlying, will there be real intimacy? The answer is no, because there's an incapability, an immaturity that doesn't allow uh, a real intimacy. We simply don't have the skills. But we have learnt ways, like the AAC it says at the bottom, at that bottom box, it says that it reflected, reflects the way we were parented during problematic childhood experiences. So we can learn ways to relate, but we will certainly struggle at times to, to um, have real intimacy and connection. And I've heard Pia, when she lectures on this information, talk about if she had to sum this model up, it's about connection and disconnection. Now, when you come into SBP, we hopefully, by the time you left here, you not only knew about your secondary symptoms, uh, and but you had a good insight, hopefully, from either attending the changes program, if it wasn't appropriate at this admission, in primary group, learning about the impact of your less than nurturing uh, childhood experiences on the development of the primary symptoms, and both those you had direction for in your aftercare. And then what that might have looked like is if you're an alcoholic or a gambler, you might have some 12 step meetings to go to, that you've got not just the meetings to go to, but that you've been informed in group and by attending the fellowship that you get information around uh, the 12 step culture to get a sponsor to start working the steps, to buy the literature, to start journaling. And then hopefully if you've got uh, the, the trauma, uh, that, that you've been referred to a good therapist if you didn't already have one to continue to work on that. Excuse me, folks. <laughs> that you can continue to work on the healing that you hopefully started around the impact of uh, the, the, the trauma and neglect and abuse from your childhood. When, when I've thought about this, this journey for folks in recovery and my own journey, the, the, you'll, you'll hear one of the ways to describe recovery is we're continuing to take layers off the onion. And I certainly know that to be true when it comes to uh, early recovery, and especially when we get past post-acute withdrawal from any addiction or when we start a recovery from depression and anxiety, we, we will then get some sort of stability and then from there we start the work. Uh, Dr. Patrick Carnes, who is a fellow back at the Meadows now and running his General Parsons program there, certainly talks about those first five years of recovery 
being important and he has a particular 30 point plan around aftercare that that they they the that all the fellows at the meadows there uh, uh peer and john bradshaw and uh, uh claudia black are all espoused to the same theory that the aftercare has to be something that's really holistic and will help support someone in their recovery long term uh, by being a big ask in early recovery. Uh, and an example of that might be the 90 meetings in 90 days that you'll get, uh, that you'll hear shared about at 12-step meetings where you want folks to to really commit to something that's going to lead to what we know now as new neuro pathways that will eventually become dominant neuro pathways. In other words, that, that uh, I heard that summed up by a fellow that opened a, a, a service in town and he used to call it addiction is, and codependency is the first thought wrong disease. Uh, meaning that at times under stress, my first option, first solution is going to come from my immaturity and to be cautious of that and to know that uh, as I get into my recovery that, that I need to pause long enough knowing that, that this new information I've learned about my recovery is still not necessarily the strongest thinking that I have just yet. And, and so when we, we look at this holistic treatment plan to, to, to just sort of as a way of reinforcing what you, you hopefully learned here at SPP is uh, the first thing is, is that I'm responsible for the development of this functional adult. I, I, I was saying to folks today that, that one of the, the, the issues with this model for a person that sits in front of it in a current crisis and evidence of unmanageability and all the intimacy issues that they can they can have as a result of that is is no one's coming. No one's coming to do this for us. There's the time for parenting has passed. And and that might sound a bit a, a bit odd to say out loud, but I'd ask people to reflect on at times when you're in that immaturity, we might be in a 40-year-old body, but we can be acting like a four-year-old. And we can have that emotional competency and of, 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 of a four-year-old if we're in our wounded child or maybe of a, an acting out teenager in our, in our adult adapted child. So there's just that immaturity can still rise to the surface and we, we will either lead back to our addictions, it'll lead us to a relapse of some form if we don't address it. So the functional adult immediately highlights the fact that well, the very fact I've got to develop a functional adult in my adulthood is it has, has to mean I've got to come to grips with the grief I feel about the fact I need to do it. That that the fact that the fact I've got to develop maturity now means that at the time I could have developed it, I had to survive something. I had to to work through some deep emotions when it comes to uh, the trauma and abuse. And, and uh, it's, it's generally summed up as it's grief. The first thing I need to do is grief. I'm going to grieve what I didn't get and, and, and start to make peace with this idea of uh, re re recovery, intimacy, and reparenting. The treatment, well, hopefully when you come to SPP, we can really introduce you very quickly to getting some uh, support for your secondary symptoms. We look at the comorbidity. Hopefully, by the time you've been here a very short time, that we're on top of all the issues that are really causing you distress and then hopefully by the time you've gone into our changes program or done that family of origin work you've got some real clarity about what your functional adult needs to look like but the fact is it'll still need to come from you that you're responsible for your recovery but in taking responsibility for your recovery you can elicit all the support that's on offer either from a place like SPP or, or, or the support from the recovery community when you leave here. So the idea of treatment, recovery, intimacy, and reparenting, it, it, it's about coming back to connection. Uh, the treatment is getting that initial treatment, interrupt those crises, interrupting those addictions, interrupting the mental health and eating disorder issues. And, and in particular too, looking at, especially for folks, I think one of the things we do well here is we will talk about love and avoidance addiction. And there's a lot of places that this isn't even on their agenda, that we look at the impact of certain parenting styles, whether it be uh, abandonment or enmeshment and how they result years later in continuing to repeat those patterns in how we do relationships. And what I love about this program, especially being a love avoidant addict in recovery, just how helpful it's been to come in and say, ah, that's why these relationship issues still occur for me. And so 
that why we look at this functional adult, if I bring your attention to that bottom right hand corner, is we need treatment from those secondary symptoms, we need to get into recovery around them, and then we've got to grow these intimacy skills. And the way we start that is beginning is is uh, is, is becoming intimate firstly with ourselves. I've got to learn about my reality. I've got to learn about my reactions and and uh, one of the tools we use here for that is leveling. It's one of those very simple tools. You can journal it. You, you, you certainly don't need to say a level out loud to get the benefit from it because it's about you learning about your reality. And so if we can get that data, and so much so that when Pia wrote the, 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 the revised edition of, Love, of Facing Codependence, at the beginning she notes that when she first did this work, she was so adamant, boundaries, boundaries, got to learn boundaries. If you've got trauma, boundaries is the first skill that you need to learn. And in the revised edition, she talks about, you know, to, to set a boundary, I have to know my reality to the best of my ability. And so I need to first know what that reality is. And levels, using that leveling format, we'll certainly do a webinar on leveling because I, I see it as one of those things that folks get really confused about when they come here, but I think it's one of the best tools that we can offer someone. And if you're still confused about it, please, at the end of this webinar, uh, put some questions out there because I, I, I think if it, the confusion can be allayed because I can explain how that, that is used in this model to be to be really practically helpful. And, and the reparenting is a, is a concept that's based on this model, which is uh, I need to, in, in, in a way of moving forward, I, I I need to reparent me. No one's coming. I've got to grieve that. I've got to grieve I didn't get what happened. I've got to grieve the, 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 the health parenting I didn't get. I've got to grieve the situation I grew up in, but, but I need to now take responsibility and reparent me. Now to do that, wow, I can get all sorts of support as a reparent. I, it's, it's the same as if you're a parent. I've got young kids and I know that most, most of my conversations around my wife, we're constantly coming up against what do we do now? <laughs> We've got a three-nager at the moment. So if anyone out there has ever had a three-nager, you can really come to the limit of what worked when they were two. And I think that goes right through parenting, is that we'll be humbled by uh, situations where, uh, to move forward, I'm, I'm acknowledging I don't have all the information I need. Now, a functional person, someone who's grown up where they were able to, to, uh, to get those basic core needs met, well, in their experience of life, to come up against a need where they identify, wow, well, I really need to address this and I'll need more information, they're out there and they're getting it. But in our codependency, that can trigger for folks shame and they'll really struggle to move uh, into uh, getting that need met. And in actual fact, when Pia talks about uh, boundaries and learning boundaries, she said that in early recovery, uh, when you start to set a boundary, i.e. leveling, when you start sharing your reality and putting up a boundary, you will actually feel more shame uh, in, in the beginning of your recovery than you felt when you had a wall. And, and so, uh, so it's uh, one of those things that, uh, again, I want to normalize that. If you're out there trying these new skills in early recovery and setting boundaries and walking away from it feeling twice as bad as you did before you set it, you're probably on the right track because it's a new skill. And as you finally start to set that boundary that you need for you, then, then you're going to now have to work on reparenting yourself, revaluing yourself, and telling yourself it's okay for me, only I can determine what's true and not true. And so when you set that boundary, that's the, that internal work we need to do. So I suppose in reinforcing our recovery, I want to bring us back to the pillars of this model. I want this thing that you would have seen in treatment here up on every wall in every room that you're in to, 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 to bring it back alive. Excuse me. Awful allergies today this time of year, folks, if you're watching from overseas. So in, 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 in this situation, it's, it's, I mean, I'm a nerd when it comes to recovery. I'm a nerd when it comes to Pia Melody's model because I, I find myself in it. It's a roadmap for my recovery. So when I'm working with folks, I try and sort of passionately bring them back to where are you in this? Where are you in it? And you know, what are you, when you look at your functional adult development, um, how are you going with, with, with esteeming yourself, with learning to value yourself, to try and grow that inherent worth? How are you going with boundaries? How are you going setting physical boundaries, internal boundaries? And to do that, like I said, you've got to know your reality. So what are you doing to get that? Are you you know, if you've got a good sponsor that gives you reality checks, are you going to a good therapist where you can check out that irrational and rational thinking? Are you getting a place where you can continue to practice those feelings checks, processing how you feel and 
putting it out there with, with environments that are safe. I know that uh, in speaking to some of the changes to folks today, we've certainly acknowledged that, you know, we go back into family systems that still can be functioning in pain. So how am I making sure that I'm supporting myself? Well, I'm still choosing to be there to, to grow up within a family that's still learning to grow up. And, and, and one of the ways that, uh, that I know we can do that once we know our reality, if you start to determine what your reality is and you get really clear on it, then it, that, that I've always loved the fourth column down in, in the, the dependency the functional adult uh, uh, skill, which is to become aware of. I think there's no, those three words are the three most powerful words in this model that I need to become aware of and appropriately meet the needs of self and others. I am responsible for becoming aware because if I'm not aware, I'm, I'm going to be either acting out of my unconscious or I'm acting out of my uh, immaturity because I'm not taking responsibility. And if I can become aware of that and move to meet it, I think that, but finally, we start to experience the life that we were meant to live. And that's meaning by, I have finally now got those skills to be spontaneous again. I can be in the moment, in all my imperfect glory. Thank you for that, Kelly. I can, I can see that the sound got quiet, so I might have just knocked the microphone. Is that better? If someone could, if, if, if someone could just respond to me and let me know if that the sound just got a bit better. I, I hopefully it did. So we, if if I if I continue, I'll, I'll say that the uh, the thank you very much, George. Uh, great. Uh, the, the spontaneity. I, I think it's good sometimes to focus. I know in AA they talk about the promises. They don't. The steps are the hard work, but there's the promises that come if you could just adhere yourself to the program. I think this model's the same. If I work on the secondary symptoms, if I go back and look at those uh, primary symptoms and and start that functional adult development, then then those relational issues that I experienced while all that was untreated, they start to get better. Now, initially, I think it's a real shock in family systems when someone gets well because they actually, you're breaking out of the family script. And and so, uh, again, if some of you are out there saying, oh, yeah, look, I, I moved home and, and, and I, you know, we did family program even and, and, you know, those new skills hadn't really taken hold, that's pretty normal too. Under stress, we regress. And, uh, I think that, that don't, again, let that please uh, dis discourage you in your road towards recovery. It's that trudging, that road to happy destiny. And I, I certainly would hope to think, and, and, and I do see it, I've seen it, certainly seen it me and I've seen it in others, that when you, when you get these skills, all of a sudden I can be back in the moment. I can be spontaneous. I can be open. I can moderate my behavior. And if I impact someone else, I start to have the skills to be able to then address it. I've got the boundaries, I've got the skills to level, I can make an amends, I've got that maturity on board to respond in the moment instead of the codependency, the, the immaturity that means that my shame will get triggered and I just shut down. So I suppose the, 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 that model just gives us that snapshot of, 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 of those three ego states in recovery that I need to be aware of and like I said under stress we can regress and 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 recently we uh, I know uh, Lorraine was was passionate about look we really need to make this this uh, an attractive document so people will look at it and really get it in, a, in you know we want the images to really show uh, you know what it's like to be a wounded child where we can go in our adaption and and and, and where we're trying to head and uh, I, I suppose the functional adult images certainly look peaceful but the idea is is that is that when I'm in that ability to function I can take care of myself. I, it's my job to value me. I can set boundaries. I can I can identify what's going on. I can I can self care, and I know how to to live with some level of moderation. But from there, I need to parent those two kids, that inner family, the the wounded self that at times can can get into an age regression. That really goes back to being disempowered and worth less than others, and 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 struggling with boundaries, or. And at the very same time, in reaction to the, the adult adapted child that then tries to get back in there and save me. And, and, and unfortunately, it saves me, but, uh, but it doesn't allow me to have the intimacy I need to move forward. So, so the, those three ego states are something that in, in, in recovery we need to become, I suppose, we need to grow an expertise in, in managing, like any parent in the beginning, we're going to have really learning curves. And the longer you stay, uh, 
not just sober from your secondary symptoms but in your codependent recovery, this can get a little bit more sophisticated and we can get a bit more subtle. Once upon a time our adult adapted child might use a, a sledgehammer uh, and, and we might have learned to stop using the sledgehammer but we, we still might uh, flick an elastic band at the back of someone's head occasionally. Like we've got to learn how the subtleties are how we might do that invulnerability and better then, etc. So I suppose in in in, in working working through your early recovery, please uh, you know, again don't be discouraged if you start to see that under stress we regress and if under stress we regress and it even adapts because uh, I've certainly, I suppose the other thing I'd add to that adult adapted child, you can try and get well from the adult adapted child. I've certainly seen good and perfect recovering people at meetings, trying to get it right, being perfect, afraid of making mistakes. And we can learn uh, stuff about recovery, but we won't get all that, that deep happiness and we won't get that spontaneity and, and really truly be alive because we're still in the symptoms of our codependency. You might even be sober or clean and, and you might even have changed your lifestyle quite, quite dramatically but you'll still be in that disharmony, that discontent that can come from the two extremes and living in the two extremes of your personality. So I suppose <coughs> one of the things I heard in PML is mapping your recovery. She says, look, it's really obvious to, to look at the, the, the evidence for someone in early recovery about their secondary symptoms. If you're an alcoholic, you're sober, you're going to meetings and that sobriety is your evidence. But uh, she talked about in mapping your recovery, well, what's the evidence that you're in your immaturity developmental uh, recovery? That what the, and for some, your codependency recovery. How would you know? And so she says that, that those functional adult skills are observable when we have a healthy sense of our own reality, that we're aware of the essence of our body, that we know we, we, we're in touch, we know what's going on, that we can track uh, our thinking, that we, <coughs> we can interpret data fairly accurately for ourselves. It still might be different than someone else, but we can, we're clear, we're not in that confusion. We're able to at least attach a meaning to it and that meaning will then trigger those emotions and from there we'll be able to just make that connection. Once you make that connection, uh, then we can make a choice about our behaviour. Now for a lot of folks when they first got to recovery, they were doing behaviours and it felt like, uh, you'll, you'll hear it, uh, if you reflect on your own recovery, you might have had that time where you really felt that these things happened to you, like you were possessed. And I know with folks with rage, it feels like, God, I, when I raged, I didn't even feel it coming. It was like a silent train running me over from behind. And so so with, with, with starting to pay attention to this functional adult and learning about my reality, I'm not going to be a victim to that anymore. I'm not going to be, uh, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, sort of be steamrolled. It, 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 you still will. I was talking to folks about this today that, that, that in early recovery we generally ring our sponsors and we see our therapists when the behaviour is bad, when we're acting out, we might ring our sponsor. And as we start to get on this journey of recovery and, and, and give ourselves that permission, perfectly imperfect, when we're on that journey we start to ring our sponsor or see our therapist earlier. We ring them when we're in the feeling before we act out because we're starting to observe it. We get a good sense of it. We start to ring our therapist and our, our uh, uh, we start to ring our therapist when we, when we're having the thoughts, whether we're getting disorganized. We, 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 we can see the adult adapted child's trying to shut us down or we're heading towards our wound and we, we start to pick this stuff up earlier. And I think that's the evidence that in, in recovery I'm getting some, uh, I'm getting some skills, those functional adult skills are, are, are building. And I think the other things that were important in regards to uh, that is that I will have a sense of myself. I'll feel centered, that I'll have the ability, I'll know that my value is independent of you, that I've, I'm starting to grow an inherent worth, that you have every right to your opinion of me, but the most opinion, important opinion of me will be my own, that I'll have that ability to set boundaries and I'll see that in the evidence of my ability to contain my behaviour and my ability to protect my reality from yours if it happens to be different than mine. And and then with the needs and wants we just start to see the evidence of that, that as a need arises we can see that we're able to move to get it met. So as this image says, is that recovery is a journey not a destination. I know it's cheesy and I know the fellows from Aerosmith that are in recovery, they wrote a song about that, And uh, but I think it's true. I think that there's uh, sometimes a hunger in early recovery that we've got to tick these boxes, we've got to work those 12 steps, we're going to get to this place where somehow we won't have to 
be in the role of parent, reparent. And, and, and I think uh, like parenting, which is a lifetime's commitment to another being, uh, in the beginning high needs, do for, help do, stand back and support, reparenting is the same. In the beginning, it's do for, it's a hands on, I've got to really work hard. And as we grow that maturity, we, we start to get those skills and we can help do. And then in the end, that maturity becomes quite inherent, that it becomes more natural. Those, those pathways, those new neuro pathways that get built through repetitious recovery behavior start to become our first thought. And so we don't have that first thought wrong disease anymore that we can actually rely on the, 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 the I suppose, the outcome of we, we say here, trust that process. If you trust the process, work the program and follow those rules, then you can predict that, that eventually the, the, that our recovery will be stronger and more reliable. But as I say that, I certainly don't want to set anyone else up out there that, that is struggling because uh, I certainly spoke to John Lee, who's a, a person that SPP has had out here for training and, and, and run wonderful workshops for us. And he certainly says that in, you know throughout the journey of recovery, we're going to have certain peak times and, and, and peak experiences that can become distressing for us. And, 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 and that's going to be part of that road of recovery. So I, I thought, you know, and I, I wanted to put the 12 steps up here because uh, one of the, the 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 pillars of our treatment program is these twelve step these twelve steps, and not just for people with addictions. We we have that wonderful book in our bookstore uh, called the Twelve Steps to, to Happiness. Um, that means that anyone can use these principles if you want to have some sort of a uh, handrail for recovery that allows you to to, uh, to 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 have some pretty practical skills. And, and so in regards to your secondary symptoms, these can be very practical. And, but I'll just mention the first three right now, that it, it, and, and that could be another webinar this year, is, is lo looking at 12 steps, the 12 steps culture, and for any of you folks that are new to the 12 steps, that might be a, 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 another good opportunity for us to spend some time. But the first three, I think, are essential in early recovery, and, and uh, starting with that we have to have an admission. For us to get well, for us to start treatment, we have to have an admission. I've got to admission, admit that I'm powerless, and not just over the substance, but over um, that all the neuro pathways that exist in, inside of me, due to due to my history and due to my secondary symptoms, I can't get rid of those. And that if I the the, 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 the juxtaposition of whenever I try and be powerful over them, my life becomes unmanageable. Once we can admit that, really, we're just admitting that we're in big trouble. That wow, I've I've really behaved myself into this space where I can't be normal now. I, I've got genuine needs that need to be addressed. Otherwise, I'm going to live a life that's full of crises, unmanageability, and intimacy issues. And so the second step says, well, very quickly, we came to believe in a power greater than us. And one of the things I love about SVP is we say that that our our best thinking got us here. It's a twelve step saying, and that that we. Um, the definition of insanity in regards to the steps is just repeating the same mistakes, expecting a different result. And, and regularly we see folks coming here saying, look, I've really tried this in every way possible to do this myself and be powerful over this, but it just keeps getting more and more unmanageable. So that coming to believe in a power greater than you is, is that I need help. It's got to be greater than me to restore me to sanity. I, I will not be restored to, to, to sanity to try to do something different if I don't make that initial admission of powerlessness, initial admission of my life's unmanageable. But the second step only lets us know the way out, but we haven't worked through the we haven't walked through that turnstile yet. We walk through the turnstile of change when we make a decision and that's that third step. The, 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 and, and I see plenty of folks at twelve step meetings on the first step. They admit they've got a problem, they'll share about it every week, they'll share about their relapse, and even if they've got uh, like a, a gritted teeth recovery they, 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 because they don't work, work through this third step turnstile into real change, they don't, they don't experience the blessings of recovery. And, and that third step turnstile is we make a decision, can't be made for us, not by anyone else, not our therapist, not our family. We make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand Him. I won't get into a spiritual discussion unless there's a question about it, but I know what this, the, the, there's a couple of acronyms for God which people use in recovery that struggle with spirituality. One is grow up or die, and our programs are developed mental immaturity programs. It's like, well, I've got to grow up, or if I keep doing, making these choices, it's going to kill me. And the other one is good orderly direction. 
And I really hope that SPP is one of those pillars of good orderly direction for someone's recovery, that you can hand for a period of time your will and your life over to us with consent, uh, that, that we can give you that good orderly direction to the things that you've come here that have caused you pain and suffering. That I want us to be a part of. And I suppose this last slide is about, well, what, what can I do to support my recovery? And, I, and I'm hoping out there that your aftercare plan is intact and it's working well. And if it's not, if it's not, please, by all means, uh, you know, get back in contact with us. Is there a top-up program you can do? Can you do any of our, uh, uh, you know, is, would it be time to go through relapse or managing moods or the DBT program? Or, uh, you know, is there something else we can offer you? Uh, Please, uh, up on the, uh, the, uh, the, the screen right now, you're going to be looking at the registrations for things in regards to getting our newsletter so you, we can keep you up to date with what's going on. We've got a Facebook page and we changed it to Pacific Recovery because we knew that, that maybe having South Pacific Private might be uh, something that you might want your other friends to see. So, so Pacific Recovery is just a, a, a nice, wonderful entry point into getting to know what's happening here. We've got some awesome uh, alumni workshops coming up. I'm very excited. Some of you might have seen in the family program here we show uh, Brene Brown's uh, videos on vulnerability and shame. And uh, one of our uh, therapists, that, that Andy, that has gone over and trained with Brene and, and is going to be running the Daring Way workshops here. So that might be something as alumni that you could come in and it talks about that courage we need to live bravely in our recovery. And, uh, and, and then, of course, anything else we can help you with. So, so I, I hope this, the, the beginning of this webinar has been a, a, a place to, to start and rejuvenate your recovery, but is there any, if, is there any questions out there? If there's a, a chat box up on the right of your screen, uh, and if you click on the chat box icon uh, and just put in, is there, is there anything that in regards to some, some of the things I've shared tonight, could I elaborate on or answer a question for? So I'll, I'll just put that out there now and I'll wait and see if I can notice any uh, uh, questions coming up. Um, so I suppose what uh, we can uh, let you know about is, is please stay in c connection with us. I know one of the things we're going to grow right now is, is, is our alumni program is coming back onto uh, the agenda. We want to hear, if you, if, for some of our alumni, is, is uh, your story. We'd like to, to hear, uh, you know, uh, we, we've got a few ideas at the moment about what we'd like to do with that, but, but in particular, one of the great parts of recovery is the empathy. In Narcotics Anonymous, they say the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel. I like to think that about our alumni. Uh, no one knows the journey of recovery more than someone that's done it, that, that's walked a mile in, in shoes similar to yours. So please contact us if you'd like to share your story, if you've got a recovery story that, that you, you'd be happy for us to, 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 to have here for others at times to read, anonymously of course, it's, it's, but, but please uh, uh, let us uh, know. The email there is registrations at southpacificprivate.com.au. Um, now I've got a question here about would you email out the pages you show here tonight? Yeah, yes, Peter, I think we could. We could certainly uh, email out the PDF, the PowerPoint presentation. That would be fine. Um, yeah, so look, I think we're coming close to our time. So if there's any other questions out there, please type them on in. And and uh, if not, uh, uh, I suppose if not, please contact us here at uh, Recovery. I just want to check with uh, my public. Uh, relations manager Jackie here has been supporting me uh, off site. So maybe uh, if, if you would like to receive the, uh, the uh, uh, webinar slides tonight, just uh, that we will, I'll make sure that Jackie's writing up a message now about emailing them out to you. So we'll have your registered email and we'll, we can uh, send you a, a link to, uh, we'll send you out the slides, but also we've recorded this and we will soon be making it available so the link will be sent out to you if you've registered for this, whether you've attended this particular uh, webinar or not. So, so I think like on behalf of SPP and myself, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Uh, recovery is something I'm very passionate about and uh, I'm glad that we are working out new and exciting ways of being able to reach out to folks who might be able to get here for an aftercare program but want to tune in to SPP Way. If, and if I had to have a sign off for something like this, uh, the webinars, there's a good question, Liv, thank you. The webinars will be occurring once a month at the moment and uh, we will be, uh, uh, the other thing you'd help us with is 
uh, is letting us know what you would like to, uh, to, to, to have webinars on. We're getting a few ideas here through now. And, uh, and, and I would like to, uh, we'll take all those on board, but please contact us and let us know if there's something you'd like to know more about. And uh, shame, thank you Liv, yes I'd love, I'm actually looking at a project here where we're going to talk about uh, doing our own video on shame, John Bradshaw's resources is something that I've found an amazing tool in my own recovery but I know now that the information on shame has changed a lot so we're excited to be working on that. So I, I suppose I want to thank you very much and, and as, I was, as a sign off for this, as we say when you walk into this place and you walk past reception, uh, it, it, it asks you to, to to uh, ex expect a miracle and when you leave this place it reminds you that you are a miracle and I think what I get out of that is is that it's there for a reason that that inside of us is that inherent worth that preciousness that's just waiting to come out and I do believe that our program is one of those things that helps folks get down to the core and uh, of, of, of what that preciousness is we can get that shame out of the way so uh, as I said, I will uh, certainly hope to uh, answer more questions as we, we, we have different webinars. Please send in your ideas. I know that there's one question here and I might take a moment to look at it and uh, to just let me uh, to get the whole question elaborating on the layers of the onion that come up further down in Recovery Road and how that, that it is not necessarily a sign that you've gone back to square one. Uh, that is a one. That's a wonderful question, Kelly, and I think I really needed to hear in recovery that this is a normal part of recovery, that it, it feels like sometimes you're taking a step forward and three steps back because you make this progress, you hit a bit of a plateau, and then all of a sudden another layer of discovery of the impact of your developmental trauma or under stress another uh, behaviour becomes more obsessional and compulsive. Next thing you know you might have started in Alcoholics Anonymous and now you're doing CODA as well or you're doing Overeaters Anonymous as well. So I think that, that yeah, by all means that, 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 that we can only at the beginning of recovery start with the current crises and the really the sharp edges, the pit bulls, the sharp edges of the unmanageability. From there we, we, we start to get into the more subtle and sophisticated layers of that trauma uh, and its effect on our development. So I, I think absolutely please don't think that you uh, are, are taking steps backwards and somehow your recovery is faulty, it's just that trudging part of trudging the road to happy destiny. Uh, the, and, the, and there was a question there by Peter, Peter about the feeling out of place a lot of the time and identify that isolator avoidant codependency. You know, I, I, one of the things I know with our program, we speak very strongly and passionately to love addiction and even the Facing Love Addiction book, the avoidant addict section is very small. I'd like to see us grow uh, our program and, and what, I, what I'm excited to, uh, what I will put out, we are just about to start here and, and our flyers are just about to come out, uh, men's and women's, two groups, uh, sexual addiction, intimacy, love and avoidance works like 10 week programs, they're ongoing programs. So if you've got avoidance addiction, love addiction or sex addiction, we're going to have a men's and women's group running starting in May, uh, in, the, in the latter part of May. So if you're interested in something like that, you know people that would be interested, I will be running the men's sexual recovery group and, and intimacy and healthy relationships group and we will be uh, getting a therapist really shortly to run the women's one. So I suppose for the avoidance uh, addiction, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, that's a good question. Would we have access to those by webinar? I'd say no, we wouldn't at the moment, Kelly, but we can certainly do a webinar on sex, love and avoidance addiction. And who knows, we've got them down once a month at the moment, but you know what? They could be coming faster than that. I think if we've got the interest and we've got the audience, we can, we can move to accommodate it. So, look folks, I, I, want, to, I want to thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, any other questions, email them to us. I know that uh, uh, Jackie Grant, the public relations manager who's been assisting me tonight and myself, I just want to thank you and, and, and remember you're a miracle and, and we, we mean it. So good night, take care.